Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues? Or the stories that impact your life? Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, though. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Coming up, it's a general election year. Hooray! Our political parties are already jockeying for position this week to win your vote. Today was the turn of Reform UK, minus Nigel Farage, and the Lib Dems. Could they defeat the Tories and Labour? Also, shock, horror, as the junior doctors are back on strike, demanding more money. What does this mean for an already battered and bruised NHS? And Luke Littler, the 16-year-old dart sensation, is hours away from lighting up Ali Pali once again at the World Darts Final. We'll have all of the build-up. And, of course, it's your call. This show is all about your response and opinions on that subject of politics. We're asking this question. How would you vote if there was a general election tomorrow? The lines are now open 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722 or on the socials. It's at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Katie. Good afternoon. Twin blasts near the Iranian general Qasim Soleimani's tomb has killed more than 100 people. According to Iran's state broadcaster, over 100 people were also wounded when the blast hit a procession near the Saeb al-Zaman mosque in the southern city of Kaman, where mourners were marking the fourth anniversary of his assassination. Well, this comes after Hamas deputy leader Salah al awari was killed in a Beirut blast, which an Israeli spokesperson says was a surgical strike against the Hamas leadership. A 15-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder after, over the death of 16-year-old Harry Pittman. The Metropolitan Police have said the teenager was arrested on Tuesday along with an 18-year-old man who was held on suspicion of a fray. Harry Pittman was celebrating New Year's Eve with friends on Primrose Hill when he was fatally stabbed. Thousands of hospital appointments and operations will be cancelled over the next six days as junior doctors take part in the longest strike in the NHS's history. Members of the BMA in England have staged the walkout as they call for a 35% pay increase. Talks have broken down since the government pay offer was rejected in December. Junior doctor Dr Emma Runswick says restoring pay is the only way to keep the NHS afloat. It's a real shame that the government feels, feels that it can treat us so, so poorly. Year on year, real terms pay cuts. We're now down 26% against what we were paid in 2008. The work is not easier, the work is not less busy. We've got a worse service with fewer colleagues and we're really struggling. More than 300 flood warnings are in place across England and Wales after Storm Henk brought winds of over 90 miles per hour. Well, it comes as police in Gloucestershire say a man in his 50s has died after a tree fell on the car he was driving near Kemble yesterday afternoon. Commuters are being warned to expect major travel disruption today as the clean-up gets underway. The bad weather is still causing severe disruptions for Greater Anglia, South Western Railway and Great Northern Rail services. HSBC has become the latest lender to cut mortgage rates. The High Street Bank says its new deals will be introduced tomorrow, which includes a two-year fixed remortgage rate of 4.49% and a five-year deal of 3.94%. It comes as more banks and building societies are expected to follow suit in the coming weeks. Luke Littler is preparing to be the youngest person to take part in a final at the World Darts Championship. The 16-year-old will face world number one Luke Hemp Humphreys tonight. Well, these people from Luke's Darts Academy told Talk TV why they think he's so special. I reckon he could be the next Phil Taylor. And he, he could be a lot, he, he can possibly win a lot more than, than what Phil Taylor has. He is only 16. And not many people, even when they're older, not many people are that good. He is ridiculously good. He really is a special talent and he deserves the hype he's getting. That is the latest news for now. Let's check in on the weather with Nazanin Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's not looking as windy today compared to yesterday thanks to Storm Henk. It's now moved away, so for today it is calmer but still quite blustery out there with a lot of wet weather to be had as well in the way of showers for most of the UK as you can see from the earlier satellite and radar but also spells of rain. In fact, rain on and off across Scotland this afternoon where it will be rather cloudy and rather blustery around coastal parts. Wind's still strong around the English Channel coastline and the Bristol Channel coastline too with gales likely and there are lots of showers as I said becoming widespread across England and Wales and a few for Northern Ireland, some heavy and thundery, particularly out towards the west. Now, overnight, the showers will tend to ease from the west, so it will become somewhat dry and clearer by dawn, and the rain will ease across Scotland too, so carrying on across the far northeast, mainly over Shetland and Orkney, but mainland Scotland becoming drier and clearer from the west, and a tad colder compared to previous nights. And then tomorrow, we've still got some wet weather around. There will be showers, mainly across parts of Northern England, Northern Ireland, and the northeast of Scotland will continue to see wet and windy conditions maybe even a little bit of snow for Shetland. Otherwise, it's looking mostly fine, but southern counties of England will see some rain later in the afternoon, which could cause some flooding issues. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Well, it's the first week of January. You can almost feel the heat of the printing presses as they begin spewing out reams of leaflets and literature telling you who to vote for at this year's general election. Now, we don't yet know when that date is. It could be spring, it could be autumn, but the smartest guys in the room are taking no chances. Press conferences and policy announcements are your post-Christmas bonus as you make your way back into the daily grind of normality. For the politicians, though, there's no time to rest. The Conservatives and Labour say it could be us. The Lib Dems, remember them, led by that political genius Ed Davey, says it might be them. And Richard Tice's Reform Party are a little more pragmatic about things. They say it might not be us, but we'll certainly mess it up for all of the others, particularly the Tories. Lee Anderson, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, has issued a warning. He says that Reform UK pose a bigger threat to the Conservatives than the Labour Party do. He says that with Nigel Farage still being seen as the figurehead of reform, they could make enough inroads into Tory constituencies that would let Labour in by the back door. Mr Farage today warned the Tories that illegal immigration is rapidly climbing up towards the top of the list of voters' political priorities. Now, let me just remind you as well, reform are currently polling at nearly 10% in the polls. In election language, that's pretty damn big. This morning, Richard Tyson's, Tice's party was straight out of the election traps with a press conference down there at Westminster. They didn't give too much away, but did issue the country with this warning. Starmageddon, outlining what the country might look like under Labour. Meantime, the Lib Dems are also out and about today. They're currently polling at about 11%. That's just a whisker ahead of reform. Their leader, Ed Davey, has unveiled a poster, the crafty devil. He wants to, quote, tear down the blue wall. He's hoping to capitalise on some of their more recent by-election results and claim some Tory scalps. Michael Gove and Jeremy Hunt are targets for the Yellow Warriors. Watch out, boys. Big Eddie is in town. But regardless of glossy posters and big personalities, this election will rest on those red wall seats of the country. Ashfield, of course. Bishop Auckland. Don Valley. Think Sedgefield and Workington, it's these areas that really matter. Seats that for decades were only ever red suddenly turned blue in 2019. The smart money, however, says this year they may well revert to red again. If the Lib Dems stir the pot and reform make some inroads, the Tories could be kicked out by default. So, while you battle with travel chaos, storms and the festive blues, spare a thought for our political masters who, as you sleep, Continue to graft, vying for your kinship, your support, and ultimately your vote. But where would you put the cross on the ballot paper? If there was an election tomorrow, how would you vote? The lines are open now, 0344 499 1000. Who gets the tick in the box from you? Joining me now is James Price, former government special advisor with us. Um, there is a sense, James, I mean, there's no exaggeration here, that it is, we are building up to something, right? Absolutely right. Yeah, it's going to be a long, busy year. And of course, yep. 
not just in the UK, but around the whole world. We're going to fund the American election, the Indian election, there's one in Taiwan coming this month, European parliamentary elections, not sure they're going to you know, change too much either. Are they it's still going? Oh, well, not for us, fortunately. Weren't we a member over there once? Apparently so. I remember long those days ago, and so way back Simpler times. Day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Indian elections are going to be... That is hugely significant for obvious global reasons. America, similarly. But over here, I said at the beginning, and we don't know whether this is going to be spring or autumn... Um, I thought it was unthinkable that it would be spring. I couldn't see why Rishi, what, what he's got to gain in it being spring, really, other than there are a few economists saying, you know, these tough times are not over, the rest of the year could get worse in some respects. If that is the case, then spring it would be. But where would you put your... Uh, your money if you were going to Paddy Power tomorrow on this, James? Figure the pun. I don't think he'll be springing uh, a May election. On us. I think it's going to go longer. OK. Uh, I think, are we going to be able to have the boat stopped by May? I think that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's possible we could get, you know, it said it's got to be done by spring. Well, spring could be, what, the last day of May, technically. So, you know, there's some True. hope that we could get a first flight away there with all the different legal wranglings of that. Yeah. Uh, is debt going to come down? Uh, when it's just waiting lists are going to come down? You know, these are some of Rishi's other big pledges. Yeah, I think yeah. he was going to want to go longer, hope that things get better. Does the war in Ukraine ease up? The economy gets a bit better. I think it's going to be a later election. It's not going to be into December, that horrible Christmas election that we had last time round, I don't think. I think what? it'll be a little bit before the US election. Yeah, I think so. What, what, what is, like, barking mad? about all of this. The, way, the language we are now talking, or the way we are talking about this, if uh, an a uninformed onlooker were to jump in on this conversation, they would assume we're talking about a government that's got a majority of about three. And we're talking about a government that's got a majority of 73 or something. I mean, this is mayhem, really. This is unprecedented, almost. 70-odd majority. It's down a bit from when, when Boris came in in 2019. But nonetheless, it should be unthinkable that someone is going to easily usurp that. But that is the language we're now speaking. It's yeah. game over for the Tories. Starmer is in. Starmageddon is upon us, to quote Richard <laughs> Tice. Um, that's where we're at. End of story. I mean, God help us with Starmageddon anyway. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, Mr <laughs> Tice makes a fair point, I have to say, on that. But nonetheless, it's you know, 73 majority, 74, whatever it is, in I, that ballpark. I think, I think the, the, what's going to be happening increasingly in, in our kind of elections, we're seeing in America, we're seeing here as well, Things like social media really change. People get more informed. Yep. They, do they get more information? They switch on later. Frankly, everybody's pretty fed up with politics the last, what, almost 10 years or so now. Yep. So people are starting to sort of switch off. They only start really making their minds up later. It's been pretty unprecedented times. I'm looking forward to some precedented ones at some point. What about, like COVID. What about Reform UK, James? Um, I mean, you know, similarly, you know, UKIP made inroads. They didn't translate it into Westminster success. Well, I think they did for about half an hour with one seat, as I remember. Uh, but generally speaking, They've, they've dented the, the Tory vote before. I think 2015, as I remember rightly, was pretty spectacular for them um, in terms of votes. Uh, can reform do anything like that? There are some critics who say without Nigel Farage, they can't. I mean, I think Richard Tite is a pretty good operator, frankly, and regardless of whether you prefer one or the other, I think the, the idea of reform is very attractive to many people. Yeah, I think Tice has to work out what it is he's really after on this. In 2015, UKIP got 4.2 million votes or something like that. As you say, it only translated into them keeping one of the two seats that yeah. had defected from the Tories. But it forced the Conservatives under David Cameron to promise that famous in-out referendum on the EU. And that's what Farage really wanted. That pivoted into the Brexit referendum campaign and so on. Brexit yep. Party, that was, again, the kind of pre precursor to this, won those uh, European elections last time we were in them. What was that? True. March 2019. Yeah, yeah. And they came first. And, and Theresa May's Conservatives got, I think, we were down on 9%. You know, something absolutely horrendous. And yes. then that, that was the reason that really kind of forced her to leave again. So when they, these guys have some kind of role like that, the problem that Tice is going to have is, well, if you're warning about Starmer, every vote that goes towards reform is helping Starmer get in again. What is it they're actually pushing the Conservatives to do? Right? It needs to be a laser focus, I reckon, if, if they're going to do well on kind of one, maybe two policy areas, try and really influence the Tories to, to adopt those kinds of things, and they can win even if they don't actually win in the elections. Yeah. And the, just the perception that the Tories... I was trying to explain to my 10-year-old this morning. I got into... I went down a rabbit hole. I started off with the story of when... Do you remember when David Cameron left his kid in a pub? <laughs> 
Um, accidentally, of course. You oh, know, and I, he said, who's David Cameron? So I explained who David Cameron was. He said, I, I thought it was Theresa May that was the previous Prime Minister. I said, no, no, there was, there was, there was, there was Theresa May. Then there was, Liz, there was Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss. And he says, how many Prime Ministers have we had? And I said, yes, a lot. We used to laugh at countries like Italy for this kind of behaviour. <laughs> and here we have half a dozen in about half an hour, for goodness sake. So It's, it's been quite a wild, wild ride. I mean, the nice thing about it, in a way, though, is that it's shown that our kind of unwritten and yeah. partially uncodified constitution has handled all of this stuff really well. Indeed. Again, we just mentioned and Theresa May, her government is kind of coming to the end of things. There was that horrendous stalemate and deadlock. The constitution survived. We ended up with that big majority. The public tend to get these things right, and we'll see what happens at the Indeed. end of the year. Uh, we'll talk to a Conservative MP shortly and someone on the issue of uh, the elections and where it's likely to go. Um, also, James, the longest strike in history has put the NHS in real trouble, I think. A million appointments in a week could be lost as a result of this. I mean, it's just extraordinary. I don't know whether any of these doctors have still got public support on this any longer. No, I think this is going to be really, really damaging. I think it's going to cost lives, frankly. Yep. I think, you know, if people are going to be sat at home, they're going to be very scared, and I think rightly so. I mean, the, the big problem with healthcare in this country for a long time has been the inability to acknowledge that the NHS is an imperfect system. It's not criticising the nurses, nor the doctors, nor anybody that works in that system. It's the system itself. Partly it's the funding, it's the fact that it's so difficult to get new reforms in there, new technologies, all these sorts of problems. And we say, well, if, other than this, it's going to turn into America and people will die because they can't get health care. And they're exemplifying this by going on the longest strike ever. Yeah. That seems madness to me and very cruel. Yeah, it does seem very cruel. I wonder whether, you know, we know I, I think there's also a difference between the support that nurses have and the support that doctors have. And, you know, this word junior doctors is quite misleading because people think it's, you know, sort of some 19 year old who's just out there trying to, you know, b begin their career. Well, a junior doctor could be somebody with 20 years' experience. Right. I'm, a I'm, qualified I'm, doctor. I'm not saying this to cover my behind with my doctor mates. They're all great people, or the nurse I know, wonderful people, all the rest yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. But there, there is this difference. Difficulty if, if a doctor says something, we now suddenly think, well, they must be right, they're, they're a doctor. And actually, that's not how it works because politicians have to balance does the money go on schools, does the money go on people's benefits, does it go on our armed forces of yeah, the world yeah. getting more dangerous? You know, it is, to use that horrible centrist phrase, a lot more complicated than all that. Indeed, yes, true. Um, just a final word, we'd be failing if we didn't, James. Luke Littler, a man who... 25 minutes ago, nobody had ever heard of. He's now the biggest name in the world of darts. He's only 16, looks a little older, but he's a damn hand at the hockey. I mean, this is a kid that knows what to do with three arrows. I mean, this is a 16-year-old who's got a bigger beard than I have. It's incredible. <coughs> it is. Uh, it's That's an injustice that, in itself. Isn't it's it? a shame that he won't be able to celebrate with a pint in a way <laughs> if he wins or loses. But it's an amazing story. And, you know, I've tried my hand at playing some darts this Christmas. How'd I came on? third to my 16-year-old niece. Did uh, you? And a 70-something-year-old grandfather as well. So... I still got a little way to yeah, go. Yeah, that's so. You're yeah. You, you were shown up fully at the board. It hurts. It hurts. Yeah, it Hopefully, hurts. Luke Littler can do a bit better. It, what, what's lovely about darts is uh, if people aren't massively in, into it, and darts is usually the thing that you come back from the pub, and it's on late at night, like snooker, and you sit down at the sofa, you're a little bit worse for wear. And you channel hop and you go, oh, what's this? And you end up watching 10 minutes of darts. That's usually the only time most people come into contact with darts. But this, of course, has changed. Now people are genuinely watching this in large numbers. I sat and watched the whole thing last night. Well, and and we, can, we can bring this back into politics. Rishi Sunak's big thing, he wants to get people to get better at maths. Yep. We've actually been really quite good at maths to work out what it is, what scores you need to get next and all the rest yep. of it, right? To get that 180 in the triple 20s and all these things. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Rishi could turn to dance if it doesn't quite work out in the election. Well, these guys are working it out brilliantly and some quite common complex equations yeah. within all that. It's not just a what do I need next. There's much more to it in terms of how they're counting down because they want to know the route they're going to take to get from 501 to win the game. Um, and that's impressive in itself. I also like the fact, you know, there's always a debate about whether it should be an Olympic sport. I don't, what do you think? <laughs> I think we're going to get into the Olympic sport world. We, surely we should be and getting we've got, squash in there We've first. got break so, done. Is squash not an Olympic no, sport? No, 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 absolutely not. not. I didn't be. know that. Yeah. And I think we're getting in, we've got, is it BMX? It's a Commonwealth sport. One and some it? other silly things as well. We've got not only BMX, the best one that nearly knocked me off my feet, break dancing, I think, France, this, or this year now. Um, oh I think dear. there's break. If you can put break dancing, you can put darts in. Or a nice leisurely game of patong, because the French would call it, or bowls or whatever it is. Bowls. I think that'd be great fun. That's the one, beautiful. Good to see you, James. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, Reform UK and the Lib Dems set out their vision for this year's general election. Will we look, we'll be looking at the political landscape next. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker.
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Listen you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. And um, welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Now, Reform UK believes Nigel Farage is keeping his cards close to his chest ahead of the up and coming general election. As he sets out his party's stall for 2024, Richard Tice said Mr. Farage was still assessing a return to the political front line, while he also warned that a Labour win at the polls would lead us to Starmageddon. There are fears within the Tories that Reform UK could pick off a lot of Tory MPs, with Conservative Deputy Chairman labelling them the biggest threat to the country at the moment. Joining me now, Professor of Politics, Senior Fellow at the UK in a Changing Europe, Rob Ford. Rob, good afternoon to you. Nice to have you with us. Um, I mean, I find all this deeply fascinating, what might happen. Um, I mean, let's just start with Reform UK. They make a lot of noise when people respond to, you know, who do you think might make a difference to this country? Many people, certainly anecdotally, seem to say, well, I think Reform UK, they speak my language. But the reform types of parties, I'm thinking UKIP in particular, have never really had. They've won votes, I think 2015, if memory serves me correctly, done rather well, but not translated that into any big electoral success. Well, it depends how you define electoral success, Ian, I think. Um... They don't win seats. Uh, the only seat they ever got was a conservative defector. Mm. But they got 14% of the vote. And most importantly, if you go back and look at what was on UKIP's agenda in 2013 to 14, the Conservatives adopted most of it, uh, in particular uh, leaving the EU and fundamental reform to the immigration system. Um, Nigel Farage remembers all of that very well. So he knows 
that the route to influence when you're a party like Reform UK is not through winning seats in the Commons because their vote is too evenly spread across the country to achieve that. The route to influence is by putting pressure on the Conservative Party and thus getting them to adopt the kind of ideas that you want to see in politics. And that's exactly the playbook we're seeing them uh, roll out in the last uh, few days or so. In terms of, I mean, let's talk about Nigel Farage. He's, uh, you know, whether, whether people like him or not, he's a, a bit of a powerhouse. He's a, a very eloquent speaker, very persuasive, quite mesmeric, some might say. Um, he knows his territory rather well, and he's darn good at selling it. Uh, does the party, does Reform UK, where he's still, I think, honorary president or something like that, uh, do they need him around to make some of those inroads? Well, I mean, I think one of the most important questions uh, for this next general election is what will Nigel do? Because there is no doubt that his profile and stature with the public is just miles ahead of anybody else in that mm. party. There's a huge chunk of the former UKIP electorate um, that regards him as their favourite politician, uh, particularly now that Boris Johnson is a bit of a busted flush. Um, so if he plays a high-profile role in the election campaign, then I, there's little doubt in my mind that that will push the Reform UK vote up from where it would otherwise be. And many of those Reform UK voters are likely to be 2019 Conservative voters who are unhappy or disappointed with how this government has performed. So a bigger role for Nigel Farage means bigger worries for the Conservative Party. Yeah. Of course, UKIP are still going. I mean, dis despite not having quite the same profile as they once did. Uh, I, I could imagine some people might get confused on election day, uh, still thinking in UKIP terms. Well, I mean, I don't think that they're going to be standing in more than a handful of seats. I guess some people will see that and think, oh, that's Farage's party, I'll vote for them. So there'll be a little bit uh, of that. Um, as I mentioned, though, I, I don't think it's likely to affect reforms, prospects of winning seats, because I don't think they're going to win many seats. Mm. Um, but it might uh, reduce their vote total. And obviously, they want as many votes as possible for sort of post-election bragging rights in terms of how many votes they've hauled in. But... I mean, I, I, I forget the figures, but the, you're really down to very few places where they're even competing anymore. They're really uh, yeah. a kind of declining rump outfit at this point. In terms of reform, back to them. Um, I, I mean, the, the point that Lee Anderson was making, which I, I, I'm pretty sure most would agree, is that, in fact, it's reform that are the bigger danger to the Conservatives, uh, not really the Labour Party, if that makes sense. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it in, in those terms. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the party that is most, that is the only party that is in a position to evict the Conservatives from Downing Street is the Labour Party. And every vote that goes directly from the Conservatives to Labour counts double towards uh, that outcome. One less vote on the Conservative total, one more vote on the Labour total. Um, what is undoubtedly clear though and this is where i think lee anderson does have a point is that reform uk are capable of taking votes from the conservative party that would be unlikely otherwise to go anywhere else these are not voters that are liable to vote for the labor party or in the south of england voters that are liable to vote for the liberal democrats so that pulls the conservative voter total down and makes it easier for their opponents uh, Labour or the Liberal Democrats to win. This is one of the big ironies of Reform UK, is that very often they're helping parties that are very different to them. It's a fair point to finish on. Rob Ford, thank you for your time. We will speak again, I'm sure, sticking with this subject. Let's now talk to Conservative MP James Sunderland. James, good afternoon to you. Uh, I mean, just baby step us through this, if you would. Uh, you're a party with a 70-odd seat majority. It, it should... Ordinarily, it would be unthinkable. We'd, we'd really be having a discussion. The narrative it sounds as if you're a party with about a majority of three. How is it... Well, we know how it might have gone so terribly wrong. How is it possible to redeem yourself with the electorate? Well, Ian, I couldn't agree more, and good afternoon. I've just moved house, so apologies for the way that I appear. Um, <laughs> Looking the fine in the house. It's, uh, it's, it's chaotic here, but, uh, but thank you for the invitation to come on. Look, I, I think the biggest danger to the Conservative Party right now is, is, is ourselves. I think what I mean by that is that uh, we've got a mandate. 
Uh, we are delivering the manifesto. We've got a large majority in Westminster. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to deliver what people want us to deliver, we should be fine in the next election. Um, so Rishi five pledges, I think they're about right. I think that uh, immigration is a big one for us. We're going to del deliver on that this year, um, as we have been doing. So I think the point I'm making is that actually, if we perform as a party and if we're efficient, and if we work as a team, we should be fine. Do you think, I mean, Nigel Farage mentioned uh, in the last day or so that uh, immigration is pretty much top of the list. I, I think that's probably true in some areas, not, I don't know about the people in your constituency in Bracknell, but certainly across the country, there, there's a divide on that. For some people, it will simply be the cost of living crisis. Do you think there's a danger here that even if the number of people coming across the channel, which is the obvious example, even if that continues to go down, Regardless of why, the headline is it's gone down, even if those, fl those flights start to take off for Rwanda. Uh, is there not a danger that there is still a sense, a sort of a bad smell around your party, which, with respect, tends to happen if you've been there for a decade and a half, no matter how good you might be? Well, we've been there 13 years because we've been elected to be there, and uh, there's no reason at all why we can't win another election, and we're going to. The important thing for me is that uh, we need to focus on what's important for others. What are my constituents telling me? Well, number one is the cost of living. It's the economy, it's what's in people's pockets, it's reducing taxation, it's making sure that people can afford to live and to pay their bills. That is number one. That's what I've been focused on in support of the people of Bradford constituency. But immigration is also important. I knocked on doors about two weeks ago, came across this lovely lady called Mrs Brown. She said to me, James, I'm a lifelong Conservative voter, but I'm not going to vote for you this year in the election unless you fix illegal immigration. That is, in policy terms, what we have to do. And you sense, so for you, is that the number one issue that, that's going to get voters back on track or back on your side? No, the number one for me personally is uh, cost of living, uh, which I think is tantamount to being the economy. So it's economy cost of living is one. That's number one. And it's uh, illegal migration. Uh, number two. That, that, that's what people are telling me locally, and that's what I'm focused on as the MP for Brighton. When, when is... I mean, you're a man with your ear to the ground. I mean, I, I think you hear stuff, not all Tory MPs here. When is that election, James? I'm sure you know. I don't know, actually. It's perfectly got a secret. Um, <laughs> my instinct would be that uh, it will be later on in the year. Um, I think there's going to be a sort of an alignment of stars, if you like, when uh, waiting lists come down, when the planes have taken off for Rwanda, when we fixed uh, immigration, interest rates, we're already seeing those coming down with new deals. So it's quite exciting. Interest uh, rates will come down with inflation as well. So 2024 should be a good year for the economy. We've also got to make sure we bring taxes down. Tax burden's too high at the moment. As a low state, low tax, low regulation conservative, taxes must come down. So my instinct is that it will be later in 2024. But it could spring a surprise and go early. Who knows? We will wait with interest. Uh, James, thank you as ever. James Sunderland, Conservative MP for Bracknell you. with us here on the programme. Your texts have been coming in this afternoon. Uh, this was the question we put out, and this is based on you know, the first couple of days of January. Already the parties are out there. They are electioneering. Reform UK, electioneering today. The Liberal Democrats, electioneering today. Big posters on the backs of vans, jollying their way around the UK, telling people how to vote. Here's the question. If there were to be an election tomorrow, how would you vote? John said says, I've been a Tory all of my life. I'm in my 80s, but I will now never vote for them again. Definitely reform. Sean says, let's hope this year is the end of the Tories. We need to save our NHS. And this one in from Don. If Keir Starmer, Starmer's Labour is viewed as the solution, then our country is in more trouble than we thought. We'll take some more response on that. And, of course, you can give us your comments on the phone as well. 0344 499 now, moving on. Millions of Brits are set to be targeted by the taxman with HMRC vowing to crack down on what's called side hustles. Marketplaces like eBay, Airbnb, Uber and Vinted are now required to pass on what sellers earn, allowing it to easily identify Brits who aren't declaring online income of more than a thousand quid. I'm staggered by this. Joining me now, tax lecturer and writer Rebecca Bennyworthy is with us. Good afternoon to you, Rebecca. 
Hello, good afternoon, Ian. Good afternoon. I mean, who knew? Who knew there was this? Uh, I mean, you know, to everybody, you know, a bit of eBay, it's a bit of fun. I mean, some people do make a living out of it, but, you know, every, most of us, you know, we might sell a, an old phone on there or a coat or something. Uh, if that number hits a certain target, HMRC wants to know, it seems. Well, um, this has been in uh, the tax world have, have known about this for quite a while. These uh, regulations came uh, came up on the horizon several years ago. And it's really just a case of HMRC having information from the uh, platforms, as you said, about who's taking what. Now, um, the position as regards taxes, if you are just selling some old clothes or an old phone, it's not taxable. It's not a trade. It's not income. It's just you disposing of personal items. And that that actually isn't taxable. What HMRC are obviously hoping to identify is people who are actually running a business, buying and selling stuff, doing so at volume. Um, and this will help them identify and match up across to people who submit tax returns to make sure that everybody who is actually running a business is declaring that income. As you said, Ian, uh, up to £1,000 worth of income a year isn't taxable, it's tax-free, and you don't need to register and do a tax return. But um, any more than that, and you need to get yourself a UTR, and at this time of year, hurry up and do your tax return. Indeed. So they would identify this because of bank details, one assumes, because your, you know, your eBay name might be Mickey Mouse has measles or something. They're not going to find you through that. But th this would yeah. mean that the companies would have to tell HMRC that this, this is the account well, the, that the money goes the into. The platforms are actually having to do quite a lot of work to identify who is actually selling stuff on the platform. So uh, there will be more information than, than just your, as you say, Mickey Mouse has measles name. Uh, there will be more information provided to HMRC and it should enable them to, to tie it up. Um, the, there's one advantage for people out of this, and that is that where a platform provides data to HMRC, they will also have to provide it to the taxpayer. So you will know what HMRC have been told. Um, and um, I think probably that's the most important dimension of it, is people will be told, well, we've told HMRC you've received this amount, and then they've got to take a view about is this taxable income and decide whether to declare it or not. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all understand, Rebecca, if somebody is, you know, running a multi-million pound company on Vinted or eBay or, so, or Airbnb or something, then, of course, you know, that's simple tax evasion if you're not declaring it. But yeah. there is, a, a, I suppose, another hat on would say, you know, goodness me, we know that HMRC are short of staff. We know they've got a backlog of God knows what else. You know, it wasn't just COVID that mucked them up. They've got a lot of things to deal with at the moment. They're wading through all sorts of bureaucratic nonsense over there. Um, have they really got time to check on people's eBay accounts? Well, they've got, they have allocated um, a number of staff to this. Yes, they are struggling with resource at the moment. Everyone knows that. Um, it is really tough for them. Uh, but it's it's really important that, that people sort of engage with this and, and if they have got taxable income, that they declare it. Uh, but as I say, if it's if it's just, you know, ki clothes your kids have thrown out of and you sell them on Vinted and buy some other ones, that's not trading. That's not a business. It's where people are buying and selling. Um, and that's that's a business. So up to a thousand a year, not taxable. Over yep. that, you need to get sorted. And is, do, do we know, it's a, sorry, an unfair question if you're not sure of this answer, but do we know which area is likely to be mostly under the spotlight here? I mean, Mike, I, I can imagine, obviously, eBay, there are some big sellers out there, but something like Airbnb demonstrably sounds like a business. Just, I mean, if you've got a, a place you're renting out, that's obviously a business, right? Absolutely. Might yeah. be a small I mean... one, but it's a business. Yeah, it, it, if you're renting a spare room in your house, there is an exemption for that. It's called rent a room relief, and there is an exemption for that. Um, but really, if you are letting on Airbnb, you would do very well to get yourself a, a tax reference number, file your tax return, even if you're claiming the exemption. That's that's really the best way to do it. And then that way you can sleep peacefully at night and not worry about a knock on the door. 
Indeed. Uh, and we can apologise right now to anyone who does have the name Mickey Mouse has measles, just in case we've <laughs> identified some, somebody's eBay account. who might be doing rather well out of that little plug. Who knows? Um, Rebecca, thank you very much for your time. Rebecca Bennyworthy with us here on the programme, a tax lecturer. Coming up after the break, 16-year-old darts sensation Luke Littler is through to the World Darts Championship final tonight. We'll have the latest details on that. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and, of course, on your smart speaker. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They're that right. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian College. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Uh, let's talk about Luke. I think we should. Luke Littler, the 16 year old dart sensation, is hours away from a first World Darts Championship final after defeating the 2018 champ Rob Cross last night. The treble 20 here will leave a fitting finish on double 10. And he finishes it on double 10. Luke Littler by name, but right now, the biggest name in world darts. Littler takes the giant step into the World Championship final, 19 days shy of his 17th birthday. It's a sensational story. He's a 16-year-old sensation, and tomorrow he could be the world darts champion. There it is. Luke the Nuke from Warrington has already pocketed 200,000 quid in money for his run to the final. Could be in for half a million pounds in prize money if he defeats world number three, Luke Humphreys, tonight. Asked about his preparations for the final, Littler said, I'll be doing what I've been doing. In the morning, I'll go for my ham and cheese omelette and then come here and have a pizza and then prep on the board. And that is it.
Joining me now, Nick E, brand and culture expert, to discuss how Luke Nicholas' stock really is rising. Um, nice to have you with us, Nick. Um, at what point do you go from being a sports person to a brand? Well, I think because he's now on the front page of most of the newspapers, he's now become a celebrity. And now mm. brands are all going to be looking at him and thinking they can make a lot of money for, from him, but also he can make a lot of money himself. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Because the you have to capitalise, you know, while, while the iron is hot and all, all of those cliches, I guess. Um, and at the moment, he, I mean, he ticks a number of boxes. Number one, he's 16, for goodness sake. Number two, he's obviously, maybe this should be number one, an incredibly skilled sportsman in his chosen sport. And anyone in that world knows that. And it's borne out, borne out by where he is in this particular tournament. And I guess put it all together and... Whether it's magazines, whether it's products, whether it's, you know, what dart... I don't know the name of companies that make darts, but I'm sure they'd quite like to have him holding their arrows right now on the front of a poster somewhere. And that's worth a few quid, right? Well, yeah, definitely. And the thing is, Ian, what's been so good about him too is he's kind of almost, in his interviews, talked about really great key words. So, for instance, he's talked about his love of pizza, his love of eggs, his love of the Xbox. You know, all these to a brand immediately give value. So I can imagine some of the biggest pizza companies, whether it's delivery or ones in your freezers, are going to be jumping at the bit to get him to be a brand ambassador. I think, as you say, he's 16, he's very clean, he's in a loving relationship, his girlfriend sings Adele songs really well and he is also you know he's on the tip of everyone's tongues and what also is so good about him he's like this untapped piece of sort of commodity which people and brands will be using and he has created a whole new fan base you know not everybody is a big fan of darts not many people are watching darts you know as opposed to other sports but now he's all eyes are on him all eyes are on him tonight and hopefully you know i think by the end of the year he'll be at least worth one and a half million if he wow. wins tonight yeah and, and i guess it is those those endorsements those ads those sponsorships etc which invariably exceed the money you earn for the actual sport if that makes sense Completely. You know, it's all about brand association. Again, as you say, you know, he's young. You know, as he gets older, there'll be different brands, whether they're alcohol brands or betting brands, brands at the moment. But because he, he's so clean now, I think that quite a lot of food staff, you know, gaming especially will be really interested in him. Maybe him, as you say, endorsing different darts brands, etc., and making darts a really sexy brand. And it's, it's a, bit, a big old different world from back in the day. I was looking at some videos earlier of Jockey Wilson, um, yes. who we all remember, and I think it was Cliff Lazarenko um, at the hockey uh, at a you know, pivotal moment in a tournament, and, and uh, Jockey pulls out a cigarette. Um, Cliff then lights it for his opponent, lights the cigarette <laughs> and lights one up himself. And they stand there with their cigarette and their arrows uh, all going simultaneously. So you might have got a nice... I don't know, Benson and Hedges deal out of that back in the day. <laughs> uh, but we've moved on and, and companies and corporations and brand uh, areas of brand endorsement are, are absolutely key these days to new ways of advertising and using people like Luke are absolutely central to that. Completely. And I think because Luke is so young, brands are going to get in there very quickly. They'll probably sign him up for more than a year. Mm. You know, he's got a big future ahead of him. Um, like most sports people, you know, who have a shelf life, actually, in darts, you can really play for as long as you want. So yeah. there's no kind of testimonials, etc., like you might have in rugby mm. or football or cricket. So the fact of the matter is, if Luke carries on as he is, this guy will be a champion for many, many years. Yeah. He will be nuking everybody and making a lot of money for himself and his family and brands, you know, in the process. Yeah, and you don't have to go to the gym either, which is another plus. No, exactly. Just have a pizza and um, <laughs> an omelette. What more <laughs> do you want? Yeah, indeed. Um, in terms of... I mean, I noticed at the weekend he was photographed at a couple of, sport, uh, couple of football matches. I think he was there at Arsenal and Spurs, I think. Um, would that have been a coincidence uh, that he was photographed in those places? Or would that have been no, neatly this... placed by somebody to up the profile even more? Yeah, this is a really clever way of kind of like fame by osmosis. You know, the fact of the matter is that those are huge uh, brands and, and football clubs and for him to be associated there, for players to see him, for the fans to see him, it builds on his sort of fan base himself. And it's a strategic way of making him into a household name which will make money 
for him and for a lot of people as well. Yeah, and just a very final point. We have to be brief on this one, if we could, Nick. Um, if he doesn't win tonight, does all of the above still count? I think it does because we've got him on the front page of the magazines and all the newspapers. He's a star yeah. now. There it is. Nick, great to have your advice and your words. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick Eade, who's a brand expert with us on the programme. Uh, your texts have been coming in thick and fast this afternoon. Uh, we asked a really simple question. If there were an election tomorrow, how would you vote? This is based on the fact that beginning of January, those political parties are beginning to up their game. Reform UK, the Lib Dems out today, press conferences, poster releases. Um, Brian says, uh, do whatever you... or Do what you've always done and you will get what you always had. A vote for Tory or Labour is a vote for more of the same. None of them have a vision or an ability to get the country out of the pit we are in. The country needs a complete overhaul. Uh, this in from Tad. How are you doing, Tad? Says there's a much bigger threat to the Tories than Labour, the Lib Dems or even Reform. It's called the Tory party. All the woes are self-inflicted. All they had to do was be conservative, but instead they promoted no hopers to positions of power. And Ruth says, I was a Conservative voter, we keep hearing this, but I will be voting for reform this time. Everyone I speak to states immigration as the number one reason they will be voting that way. And you've been calling in as well. Let's start off on the phones. Phil is in Exeter. How are you doing, Phil? Hey, Ian. Uh, hi. hi. Very long time no speak. Nice uh, to have you with us. What are you thinking? Um, yeah, definitely reform. Um, I just think, you know, look at the options we had. We, uh, we've got a Conservative government which had an 80-seat majority and they've managed to not deliver one thing that they actually promised they would do, yep. i.e. law and order, um, you know, uh, securing our borders and Brexit. They haven't done any of that in any, in any shape or form. On the other side of the coin, you've got Labour, who basically wants to help anyone who's not British, um, who used to be the working-class vote. Yep. And they they they've literally just gone completely away from this country. And the majority of this country um, are still British at the moment. And I think we need, we need to... My vote is a revenge vote, shall we say. I get um, that. What would, just, just tell us what would happen, Phil, if... Uh, and James Sunderland mentioned this, and our earlier contributor mentioned this as well, if some of those boxes that you would like to see ticked began to manifest over the next six months, if channel migration really did come down... It's gone down a little bit, but it went down even further. If those flights to Rwanda began to happen, if interest rates started to properly fall, if food in the supermarket really was affordable once more, if you could tangibly see that happening, could that make a difference? Could you go back to the Tories under those circumstances? Um, not ever. Um, I, I don't believe that they, they would deliver. I think a lot of the uh, the media, uh, with with the exception of your your, your you guys, um, it's all psychobabble. It's all about what's the the fashionable thing to be saying instead of the truth. Yeah. They they just ignore the truth, and we don't really know what is happening with the Home Office, for argument's sake. You know, we don't know why there is such a backlog of um, asylum applications. We just don't know all these details. We, we don't, and we, we seem to be stuffed full of professional yeah. politicians rather um, than people... I th who's that character down in... Like, Sadiq Khan, who should be in yeah. jail right now for crimes against firework displays... Oh, no. Uh, ..after, great, you know, what is. happened on News... Yeah. I think, really? This is a, an elected politician, for God. So they're messing around with this kind of caper. Absolutely. Whether it's that or whether it's, you know, Rishi Sunak, who wouldn't know his way to converse <clears> with the average man on the street if you gave him lessons in it for a year. Keir Starmer, yeah. similarly, a man with a pit of... a furnace of ambition in the pit of his belly so great, I'm surprised he hasn't exploded yet. Uh, this is a guy, you know, worked in the, at the bar... Um, always wanted to be top dog. You know, we want yeah. people who feel it, who know it, who understand it, or at the very least, empathise with it. Yeah. The constituency I'm in is Mel Strides. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've heard Welcome of Welcome pensions. And, you know, <laughs> what a joke. Um, I, I would always, you know, last the election, they were saying, don't vote for reform because it's going to split the vote away from the Tories. Um... That's why I call, I'm calling it a revenge vote, because I think the Ramona's Liberal Democrats will probably beat him um, because of yeah. the, the strength well, of the yeah, vote. You, you could and, well be right. Listen, you know, 
Phil, that's... Phil, I step in for no other reason than I want to get another call on before we finish. It's another Phil. Thank you to Phil in Exeter. Another Phil in Milton Keynes this time. Happy Phil Day, Phil. Good afternoon to you. Yes. Good, good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Ian. Just, I feel like ditto on, on this one. Yeah, go yes, on. Yes, uh, read everything that uh, Phil was saying from Exeter. Yes. The thing that I, the thing that, that's, I certainly would be voting reform without without question. And one of the main reasons I do is because the, the people that I see at the top of reform, Tice, Farage, and one of their influencers, and Widdicombe, are all straight-talking people. You ask them a straight question, and they'll give you an instant answer. But whereas with this Tory government, they're just a load of flim-flam merchants, you know? They're just given nothing yep. but waffles. And I think, you know, we've had enough of it. But the thing, the worst thing of all, is, you know, for me, it's unforgivable with, with Johnson, uh, sorry, Boris Johnson and, and this present guy, Sunak, is that they have made this country damn dangerous. There's no longer a safe place to go out at night. How anyone uh, that feels safe in London, I do not know. I mean, it's an absolute national disgrace. And they talk about, you know, human rights, you know, for all these, these migrants. What about the human rights of the people that live in this country, you know? What about our rights, you know, of prote you know yeah. being protected? Well, it's you've just... only got to... I mean, you mentioned about immigration, um, and people often raise the issue of homelessness. You know, why have you got people rowing across a channel? ending up in a hotel, when outside Indeed. of that hotel you've got a former military soldier who'd spent 20 years defending this country who's living on the streets. Now, when that's raised, I've noted... to somebody like Keir Starmer, and even maybe Rishi Sunak, wouldn't really understand the question. They wouldn't really understand what we're talking about when we raise that. I mean, that, to me, that's nothing about racism or xenophobia. That is a cast... a beautifully crystallised guarantee of governmental failure. When that Absolutely. is what you're seeing, that matey from the channel is looking down out of a window of a warm room while somebody below, who served our country for 20 years, is Absolutely. sleeping rough. That's a tangible, real example. That should defy party politics. Anyone with a brain should go, that is unex... There's your example of a failed society. Absolutely. Simple and, I mean, that. you know, this Let's let's just hope 24 will change the better. We we will watch with interest. Uh, listen, thank you very much indeed, Phil. Uh, it's interesting the amount of people getting in touch specifically on that point. Will this be the greatest rebellion of an election in many respects? Even if reform don't come back with seats at Westminster, they may well return having caused some real harm bruises and political fatalities to their opposite numbers, namely in the Conservative Party. We will watch with interest. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for watching. our first one of the new year, by the way. We are back tomorrow, of course, at the same time of 3 o'clock. Stay tuned to Talk TV. Up next, it's Daisy McAndrew, Daisy McAndrew in for Vanessa Feltz. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. You're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. 
if you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about.